Three, two, one, and we're back. Julika, welcome to our Sunday special podcast. Yes, and that means we must issue a warning That's right. to new listeners. Yeah, the, the so the warning is basically on Sunday, it's not an organized uh, presentation-based podcast like it is during, uh, normally during the week. So those of you who listen to us normally uh, every single day, it is, this is the number one listen to daily podcast in the nation for real estate agents. And pretty cool to see that we're now picking up listeners in 54 different countries. But if you're a regular listener, you used to uh, Julie and I presenting in a very sort of, I don't know, dogmatic format, yes. you know, point by point, um, with very little vamping uh, and freestyling. Well, Sunday is the exact opposite. The, this uh, podcast is essentially Julie and I defragging from the previous week and then sort of talking about what we're thinking about. Um, and sometimes the conversation is about, well, it's almost always about real estate because that's pretty much all we think about. And But sometimes it's just about other things, not necessarily directly related to real estate. Like, uh, as you guys know, Julie and I um, have a little hobby of trying to send each other the freakiest articles that we can find, trying to make each other laugh <laughs> in disbelief. And sometimes we share some of those on Sunday too, just because there's so much wackiness that's happening out, happening out there. Um, yeah, so Julie, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you. And this time we're doing it inside because we have a very rainy day on hand here in yeah, Puerto Rico with thunderstorms on the way. But, uh, you know, it's a nice break too. So the, what we were talking about um, right uh, prior to me hitting the record button here was that we need to write, and this time of year is when all the um, prediction articles start to come out, right? Fourth quarter. So Julie and I were writing down, sort of doing a little brainstorm session um, as to what we thought would be the topics de jour for all of the, you know, normal uh, 2020 predict or 2021 prediction, real estate predictions. And and as I say that, I'm thinking about yeah, actually some more that I just had pop in my mind that I'm going to write down. But really, when you're looking forward, it's um, kind of interesting because it kind of gets you to gut check yourself. And one of the premises that we like to make when we're thinking about our business or life in general, um, because it's very easy to get stuck in your own thinking, right? To think that what you're thinking is the only way to think, and then you're just going to find other people and other thoughts to reinforce it, and your confirmation bias all the while, the world's going in a different direction. So one of the things that Julie and I do is we always start every sort of conversation like the one we just had when we were writing up these ideas for what will probably happen next year. It was we start out with the premise that everything we think is wrong. I know that's a little dramatic and it's a little, you know, obviously not true. But if you start out with that idea that everything you think is wrong, everything, every assumption you make is wrong, everything you think is going to stay the same is, isn't going to stay the same, then it opens your mind up to sort of fill that vacuum of thought. And that's how you can start having creative thoughts that normally you wouldn't have because you were trying to keep yourself sort of myopically focused on how you're currently thinking. Does that make sense, Julie? It does. And I think that 2020 has kind of created some uh, <laughs> combat training for thinking out of the box and yeah, believing sure. that maybe what you thought isn't actually the case and that anything goes. Right. And so um, I'll tell you, I'm going to start out. And, and again, we just wrote down these random thoughts, but I think most of you guys will relate. Uh, I'm going to start out by making this point. And if you're not a regular listener, you really should be. Um, obviously, you've discovered this podcast, but go and just, we have 3,000 past podcasts. It, you know, we're on iTunes, Audible, we're on Stitcher, we're on Spotify, we're just everywhere. Uh, so when you're thinking about what's going to happen in the future, you always have to basically take, uh, sort of take account where you are today and then assume for the most part the behavioral patterns will continue. And for the sake of today's show, you have to assume that essentially the trends that we're experiencing will continue too. It's sort of like when someone uh, comes in, you know, we're real estate coaches and business coaches and people ask us, well, you know, how do you predict or how do you know if someone's going to be successful in, in doing anything in life, really, but business specifically? Well, one of the first things we always look for is past successes, because if you really want to know whether someone's going to be successful or not, you look to see if they were successful in the past and at what level and having done what. And sometimes, and this is quite normal, for adults, you'll find that most people, most adults, have not had any real successes since maybe they were out of high school. And it's, you know, that's okay. So if we're talking to a new coaching client or, you know, podcast listener or whatever, and they're trying to, you know, we're helping them with their mindset in essence. And they're trying to decide whether or not they really have the gumption to move forward with how rapidly the real estate industry is changing. And they're really just intimidated by it. They're sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're laden with too much fear. And it always comes back to, can I do it? That kind of dominant thought. And so we always go with the idea, well, when have you been successful in the past? And have you been successful at track? Were you successful at anything? Not even the best of the best. Just were you successful? Was there at any time when you pressed yourself to do something, even if it was from external pressure, right? 
you know, as a coach, it was a, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. When have you succeeded above the norm? When did you actually kind of break out of your own sort of paradigm of normalcy? And you will find that every one of you has a little blips of that, or maybe long-term blips, or maybe numerous blips where you really have broken out of the mold. So when you're trying to decide, when we start saying some of these things that we're going to predict is going to happen for next year, when they make you uncomfortable, uh, because it's going to force you to change, it's going to force you to you know step outside of your own normal pattern of behavior. Just remember, you've done it before. Chances are you have actually had a time in your life where you were challenged to become you know maybe above and beyond what you normally would have done, and you did it. And so when if we say something as we're going through some of these predictions, and these aren't formal predictions, we're going to work on these. We're going to hone our list down and probably come up with maybe five or ten solid ones, and we'll do some normal podcasts around it. This is us just brainstorming. But if we say something that makes you uncomfortable, I would strongly suggest you remember that thing and you don't just let it go. You don't just cast it aside as fast as possible. When, you, when you're blessed enough to come across something that makes you uncomfortable in any way, that's a good opportunity for you to really gut check yourself. Remember I started out with the premise that everything we think is wrong, every everything we're doing is wrong, right? And again, I'm trying to look for things and Julie and I are trying to look for things that cause us to a sort of rattle in our own, you know, realm so that we then will welcome in new thoughts and we can evolve faster. Now, here's a for example, historically speaking, we have we're coming through, hopefully we're, you know, more than 3 quarters of the way through this pandemic, hopefully, right? And um, everything that normally would have taken, gosh, I don't even know how long, 10 years, 20 years to happen, especially in the real estate industry, is essentially is playing itself out. So this massive external force, pandemic, economic collapse, economic rebuild, pandemic, you know, virus vaccine, all these types of things have welcomed in, ushered in a huge amount of change quickly. And and the essence of all of our predictions are, is the momentum around those changes is just going to increase. In other words, the changes that have taken place that are starting to take root now will increase, um, you know, essentially their own momentum. That's exciting or it's intimidating. You decide. <laughs> Julie, any thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, you just have, I mean, the best decision is that you will accept and participate and figure it out at the highest level because it won't be just that change you're dealing with. It'll be what that causes and what that causes, and you'll have to deal with it as well. So let's start with some of the... Here's, here, we, my notes are... Yeah. Uh, this is a bunch of chicken scratches. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> They're all you start the where you want to start. You can read. Yeah, you see how we're... <laughs> all right. So I'm going to start out with just uh, sort of re- re-underlining, in essence, I'm reading my notes. What a mess. Um, when you're thinking about what's going to happen next year, I want you to take all the trends that started this year, and I want you to assume that those trends are going to multiply, and they're going to pick up rate uh, pace. And that's generally speaking how these things work. And the first thing I wrote down was the uh, moving away from the cities or the densely populated urban areas, and people are going to start moving into um, essentially the rural areas and the semi-rural areas. Or as we said in our normal podcast, they're going to start moving into maybe the cities where people have, um, where you wouldn't consider it now because maybe you had to you know, be beholden to living in New York City. And now that you realize that you don't, maybe, uh, you know, maybe Nashville is a better option, yeah, right? Absolutely. So that's what you're going to start saying. Maybe the rural areas in North Carolina are going to be a good option. You know, it once, so once 5G, so there's the first one, first prediction is the trends to move away from these densely populated urban areas are going to increase. Now, we, it, we'll tell you all the reasons why they're going to increase. And you guys got to be careful how you react to this because you're going to think we're being political, but we're not. So, the you know, obviously, the I think the real igniter for all of this was the coronavirus. But it's followed then by how the city has reacted, how the government reacted. Now we're going to see, and what's going to uh, cause this momentum to increase and, you know, essentially help more people to justify moving away from these areas are the costs of living in those cities are going to go through the roof because of the dam- the economic damage from the coronavirus shutdowns, especially in these densely populated city centers, you're going to see every kind of tax you can possibly imagine. And then some that you haven't even thought of yet. Yeah. <laughs> so you add to that a little bit of social unrest and maybe the tipping point hits. And, you know, I was looking at a map of where all the cases are. And I mean, it's so obvious when you look at one of those coloration maps, it's all around dense urban environments, of course. Of course. So it's not just one factor. And, no. you know, if you were somebody that was kind of getting sick of that anyway, there's so many reasons that you're going to move. So and then you add low interest rates to that and 5G and you're set. Well, exactly. Well, OK, now you're going ahead with one step ahead. But it really is important to notice how your own city, you might want to put that mic a little higher. Cool. 
you might want to notice in your own city and your own you know state the conversations that are starting to bubble up about raising property taxes and that's even happening in areas like texas around dallas you're going to see that these cities are going to have to figure out how to make up for lost revenue make up for like a lot of these cities and states originally were shutting down with the belief that they would be bailed out by the federal government and that the lost revenue they had from shutting down would some, somehow basically they get a check in the mail. Well, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. So you, they're going to have to raise property taxes. And they're going to think of all other kinds of forms of taxes um, that they're going to, you know, everything you can possibly imagine they're going to tax in every possible ways. And like I said, ways you haven't imagined. So if you're living in a city, even if you've got a good income and you're seeing, you know, in a lot of cases in these densely populated areas, the property values are decreasing because so many people are moving out. I'm not over-dramatizing, guys. That This is just a statistical fact what I'm telling you. Um, and, you know, be careful, though, because if you live in Manhattan, there might be still, I'm sure there are still areas in Manhattan, for example, that are incredibly desirable. You know, all the while, there's, what, 13,000 vacant apartments, you know, well, condos. So you got to get a good deal if that's what you want to do. <laughs> exactly. and, you know, maybe you do want to stay and you just want to, you know, change where you're living, get a better interest rate, maybe more space than you had before and change your neighborhood. Well, so, and now Julie touched on the next thing. The reason, and this is an interesting technological, so we have the, essentially the genesis of the idea. The people now have the justification to move, but now it's going to make it very viable for them to move without having to worry about giving up their high paid job on Wall Street just to become a, you know, a farmer in the middle of nowhere, right? They're not just going to become a chicken farmer in Omaha. Right. What they're going to do now is they're going to be able to work their same jobs at the same, not, I mean, differently. I was going to say the same level, but I wouldn't imagine it's going to be exactly the same. Nothing replaces in person. But you're going to see 5G start to basically take hold. And Julie and I were talking about on a Sunday podcast a few Sundays ago how Elon Musk in, has uh, partnered with the satellite company. And they're essentially putting a net over uh, essentially low orbit satellites that will, uh, I don't know if it's to enhance 5G or to replace 5G, but the essence of it is, is there's going to be even more um, ways to use mobile and not be tethered to a, you know, essentially a cable or tethered to a specific geographic area to work. So if you can wake up in the morning and you can get your work done and you can, you know, video conference on your phone and you can essentially, I think 95% of the same experience of having been in an office, if that becomes a new reality, then you're going to see forever, that, and I think, and Julie and I think this is what's going to happen. Those, uh, you know, rural areas and semi-rural areas, and maybe the, even the cities that would have been like Columbus, Ohio, that are desirable places to live, but certainly not where you know top ten cities to live as far as having a high-paid job. You're going to see all these places in the country, even globally, start to become more desirable, and that's the thing that I think all of us are underestimating. Uh, people's wanderlust, people wanting to, uh, you know, it's like uh, after the Great Recession, there was this, uh, what is it called, Julie, frugality fatigue? Yeah, frugality fatigue. Yeah, and that's taking hold yeah. now, and but it's taking hold in a different way. I think you're going to have frugality fatigue. It's like quarantine fatigue, too, I think. Exactly. And, you know, there's another factor that we didn't mention yet with the whole 5G thing and people, you know, moving around. I think this will be looked at as sort of a great population migration. Yeah. And that is the fact that normally you wouldn't move because your kids are in school and they've been in the same school for, you know, however right. many grades. Well, you can either stay associated with that school with their virtual stuff and live wherever you feel like, or you can do homeschool with virtual and not have to worry about if you have an internet connection because you're living rural or semi-rural. So you add that all together and really that is a whole con uh, collection of objection handling. Why wouldn't you move? Well, you don't have any of those reasons anymore. Well, and so now expand this type of thinking. This is what Julie and I have been paying attention to. So we live down here in Puerto Rico, and there's a lot of reasons to live down here in Puerto Rico. But the biggest reason to live down here in Puerto Rico is because it's a wonderful, beautiful place to live. So many people wouldn't have chosen to live down here because of the fact that there's, you know, there are definitely costs to living down here, both real and not real, because you're living on an island in basically the middle of nowhere. So we live down here. We love living down here. We love our newfound state or what territory. is this territory? Mm -hmm. Island. It's, it's basically <laughs> it's basically a country in essence. Yeah, it, it operates as if it's a country, but but yes. you're, we're living amongst a lot of other entrepreneurs who had always dreamed of, that once they reached a certain point in life that they would live down in the Caribbean, someplace on the coast. But I think what you're going to see, because people are going to have more flexibility of where they're going to work, the coastal areas on planet Earth are going to start being populated by more by younger people and families. 
Um, you know, like, for example, Zoe, our daughter, she, Julie's finally, it took her a while, <laughs> is open to basically having Zoe be homeschooled. Well, that increases, you know, think about what the doors that opens that we don't have to be beholden to living in a geographic area for, you know, what is it, six or seven months of the year or whatever. Seems like a hundred, but yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> With the back so she can do her work on, you know, on the computer yeah. and so can you. And I like see Zoe, she's only in first grade, but you see her get her work, the, normally what she had been schooled for six hours or whatever. She could sit down in front of her notebook with the occasional prodding from her lovely mother, mm-hmm. and she can get her work done usually in two or three hours. Well, the, you know, that makes sense. There's a lot of you know, you know, institutionalized babysitting. That's what school had become, so people could go to work, I suppose, and you know, all the rest of it. And now that paradigm is going to be broken, so kids are able to get their school work done in half the time. Doesn't it make sense that all of us humans are going to be able to get our work done in half the time? How much time were we wasting? How much life were we wasting you know, going to work, just the getting ready to go to work, the mm-hmm. commute, the cost of it. The work theater when you're there. Exactly. The work, <laughs> the politics, all yeah. of the Mickey Mouse that goes with being in a physical location with other humans, right, for a long period of time. How much time is wasted? There's been so many research studies that have been done on this, but the punchline is I think all of us know mm-hmm. that we could be a hell of a lot more efficient with our days uh, if essentially we were looking forward to having maybe half the day uh, to do what the hell you want. You know what? Tim Ferriss should come out with the uh, post-pandemic four-hour work week. I bet that would be hot right yeah, now. 22-second work week. 22-second <laughs> work week. Right. I'm done. I'm out. Yeah, exactly. So what else? Predictions. All right. So that, I think, is I, our first prediction. Okay. Now, some more so meat, meat and potato ones. You can ramp on these, I think. Yeah. And I think most of you guys are clear on this. But uh, in case you're living in fear of the rates going up again, all indications are that they're going to keep them low. And yep. I've heard, and you, I think you've read as well, that maybe even for a couple of years, super, la- super Five. low. Some of our coaching clients are reporting less than 2%. I, I think know. one of what? them, 1.85%, I are heard you kidding last me? week. And that might have been a 15 year, but uh, still, I mean, that's ridiculous. And so, related to that, mortgage news the mortgage guys are predicting that there's a big shift to 90% LTV. That's different. We're seeing actually fewer cash offers because you can get money cheap. Oh, 10% down. 10% down. Oh, okay, that's right. now what does that do? That means the lenders also are being a little bit more strict on their requirements. So, they'll do it. But they're being, you know, a little more scrutinizing. So that's a trend. Well, so yeah. so hover there. I didn't write this one down, but yep. you just so there's every reason to believe. And Julie and I have been. This is something that we have this sort of obsessive interest in. I think is trying to figure out whether there's going to be inflation or deflation. Back when the house, back when the uh, pandemic started in March, Julie and I were not sure, and we'd certainly lived through the massive amount of deflation when values dropped. Right, and not just on real estate, but on everything. Values just plummeted on virtually everything. Everyone went to cash on, on most assets. Everyone was just selling out, trying to raise cash, and so real estate in everything that was a store of wealth was. Yeah, essentially, you know, drop by 30, in some cases, 50%. Let's just focus on real estate because something all of you guys can relate to. Well, we were predicting, as as many were, that there would be some level of depreciation followed by some level of depreciation. So the housing values dropped in 07, 08, 09. Well, then they started to recover in 09. And then when they when the markets crash uh, and then they correct, they always follow, well, at least they usually follow the same pattern. They'll start in the big expensive cities first, And then they'll work their way in. And so that means that if there's a a cycle where there's a crash and then there's a recovery, some of the cursory markets or the secondary markets don't ever get to see the appreciation. I'll make this real, you know, when Julie and I were selling real estate in Columbus, Ohio, there was a time back in the 90s where real estate on the coasts, at least, was appreciating. And so we would have to go on listing appointments after someone had read USA Today or whatever and, uh, you know, in Columbus, Ohio, thinking that, well, that means that house values in Columbus, Ohio are appreciating at the same rate. Nope, not even close. Nope. Because what happens is, again, these cycles can uh, affect the coastal markets and then the, the harm of the crash is never felt in the cursory markets, but also the cursory markets then never see the boom that comes as a result. And sometimes they just sort of you know fly level and that's what it is. And those are stable values, which are great for investors. Well, this time around what we saw and I'm talking about by 07 you know, through 09, we did see a crash in all property values. And that was the first time that happened in the history of the United States. Nobody had modeled out in any of these predictive analysis about consumer behavior. There had never been a time where uh, house values sort of collectively jo- uh, dropped in value. It wasn't predicted. Um, and then also the behavioral patterns of people once they were underwater in their houses was totally unpredicted too. So we were expecting that history would repeat itself, but not for sure how long. But here's what actually happened. 
the, the Fed stepped in and the Fed just flooded the uh, economy with trillions of dollars of cheap money. Julie just mentioned these low interest rate mortgages. Julie's mentioned also mentioned that you can get a 10% down mortgage. There's going to be more creative products that are going to come out like that, which in our opinion is not going to result in any kind of deflation in a meaningful way in property values. Now, something could change, but I don't think it's going to. What you're going to see is just the opposite. We're expecting, and this is where it gets really interesting, we're expecting there to be an increase in values like we've never experienced before. And it's going to be taking place in the form of inflation. Now, we don't want to get nerdy on inflation versus... Well, it'll um, look like appreciation. Right, but it's inflation. inflation. Right, so there, Julie just said it. So what's the difference between inflation and um, appreciation? Well, it feels the same, but here's what's happening. If you have an asset, your house... That's in you know appreciating in value. Well, everything else stays the same cost, right? Then you feel rich because your asset is outpacing the expense of what other things you'd want to buy. So maybe you want to buy a boat or cars or whatever, or just pay off debt, old debt, what just it doesn't matter. So that's what happens when you have a house that appreciates and everything else stays steady. In a time where there's a lot of inflation, what will happen is that everything will go up in cost. So even though the asset price or the asset value of your house will increase, so will the cost of everything else. So you don't actually have any additional buying power. Did I explain that sufficiently? Yes, but if you're in real estate, there is a silver lining, which is that your commission, because it's percent based, will right. also go up. In spite of you. Yes. <laughs> you know? All right. Exactly. So that's, that's a good thing because a person with a, quote, normal job doesn't have that advantage. Right. So you're going to get a raise is what Julie's saying. <laughs> you're going to all get a raise. So that should be something you should be looking forward to. But understand that it's not – that all ships are going to rise in certain, with an inflationary time. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe yeah. that's a I bad mean, thing. things like your property tax will go along you're, right, right up exactly. with that. And the cost of, you know, your grocery bill. I, I think our grocery bill has already gone up. Well, we live in an island in the middle of nowhere. So. Well, yes, so yeah. a little tainted with that. But um, yeah, I, so I think that'll be interesting. And, and the, the mortgage stuff goes hand in hand with the real estate trends, of course. One of the other trends that I've seen in mortgages is uh, normal people using hard money loans for convenience sake. Go right. Ahead. Well, so just to finish up that point, and Julie's point's re- you know, looping in perfectly, is that if you have an opportunity to purchase a house right now, um, and you can essentially acquire that mortgage with, with less for less than 3% for 10% down. Um, you absolutely should. And once you have that asset, hold that asset because that asset will, the interest on the loan will be essentially paid for by the inflation. Now, Julie and I have long been, you know, sort of the Dave Ramsey school of life with regards to paying off debt. Now, why have we always prescribed that to all of you? Because it, it minimizes risk. Because we've seen too many agents for too long, essentially, lived on, live on too much borrowed money and then essentially not be prepared when the market shifts. Yeah, and then they're stuck. Then they're, right. They're over and they're stuck with too much debt. We've seen that through three major market corrections. And from a coaching perspective, even though we understand how you can use leverage, the fact is, is that it's difficult to get it right. It's gambling, basically. So we've already always leaned towards being super conservative. That way, when the market shifts, you guys would be in good shape. And by the way, we're also still suggesting right now that you should keep your powder dry, which is another way of saying you should definitely have an overabundance of cash and just prepare yourself for market shifts and market gyrations. Because even though there will there is going to be and will be some um, in some asset classes, there are going to be some buying opportunities. There will be some you know ways for, that you could put your money to work and that uh, essentially have the inflation of whatever asset it is that you're going to buy uh, benefit you in more ways than it normally would have. So in a market like this, if you can buy a house with a long-term, ridiculously low interest rate mortgage, you absolutely should. Um, and don't pay it off and have a mortgage on it and have that mortgage basically be paid for by the inflation or if you want to use the word uh, appreciation of the asset. So well, that's- and, and you can kind of still work that, right? You don't have to pay all cash, but what you might consider doing, especially on investment properties or second homes or things of that nature where you are financing it, go for a 15-year loan. Pretend you just paid the other 15 or off do it, but- because the interest rate on a 15 year is even lower. I know. But the, know? but I wonder though, if for most people listening, because we have to remember we're yeah. podcasting to tens of thousands of people. Sure. It, if I were coaching somebody, I would tell them to do another 30 year and pay it as and if it voluntarily were- voluntarily. And pay it as if yeah. it were a 15 year. That's true. Because when you make Your extra payment. payments, you pay it towards the principal. But then you want the 30 year so that basically if you have a tight cash flow a month, the payment doesn't hurt you. So- I, bottom line, gives you more control. Yeah. Right. Bottom line here is definitely you're in the right place at the right time. 
uh, strategically lever up if you're given the opportunity to. Remember what Julie is saying. The counterbalance to this is there are going to be tighter mortgage restrictions. It is going to be harder to get a loan. And I'll tell you, this is the other thing. Again, we didn't write this down. Is that now more than in the previous housing correction, the government absolutely has already said we're going to step in and we're going to make it so as few people experience housing hardship as possible. Now, there are another number of articles like DS Servicing, Default Servicing News. They come out, obviously, they're in the default servicing um, uh, industry. And so their their subscribers look forward to foreclosures and short sales and the rest of it. That's where they make their money. And Julie and I are friends with a lot of these guys from back in the you know, 07, 08, that cycle. And we are paying attention to see what they're doing. And we talk to them. But what we really do is I have Google Alerts set up to see if they're trying to hire up people, right? That's where I'm paying attention. If I see some big you know, default servicing company is starting to add staff and they're looking for just staff and a whole bunch of different types of positions, well, that tells me that they know something's about to happen, right? They know that there's going to be an increase in you know, defaults and foreclosures. And so... They're not, and I'm not seeing any indication of that. And if we were to, we would tell all of you well, guys. Well, in fact, what they're hiring is people to do a whole lot of refinances and new right. loans. So that tells you, you know, follow that. And, of course, this all spells one thing, continued lack of inventory. Right. And this means you guys have to be extra frosty on new construction, on talking to your own database, who's moving next. You have to find it. And I have these conversations with coaching clients often And these are the agents who absolutely are, yes, building their listing inventory chops. They're becoming a powerful listing agent, but on the way, they're buyer dependent. Now, in a balanced market, that's okay. You can go to buyers and usually there's one house for every buyer. But when there's not enough inventory going around, you're going to have to be a lot more crafty. So here's a conversation with some of those agents. How many buyers, and for our listeners, how many buyers are you working with, right, net quote, working with? who the only reason that they're not in contract is because you haven't been able to find them something. That means it's on you to be super proactive. So I think that pressure is a continued trend. I do too. Um, So these next points Julie and I wrote down, let's try to encapsulate these, okay? Sure. So here's what I wrote. The next points we wrote down, I'll just read these guys to you, uh, these points to you, and and then I'll tell you where my mind's at and Julie's mind's at. So we think, and, and Julie, this is, I think, encapsulating like three or four points here. Sure. We do think there's going to essentially be um, three or three to five dominant players in the real estate industry that are going to emerge um, as the leaders as a result of all this iBuyer, um, you know, I think the surge in iBuyer interest, which is inevitable. There will be a surge in iBuyer interest from uh, sellers. Even if they don't go the iBuyer route, they're going to be aware of it. And if you're Zillow, and you're running ads uh, for iBuyers, and you have 10 people that are saying, yes, I'm interested in an offer, um, and then let's say only one or less than one says yes to taking a reduced price, that's still nine you know, seller leads that Zillow then has. Zillow is now a national real estate uh, broker. They Just be clear about that. And they're then going to send those leads back to their in-house salaried agents. And that is going to change the nature of of how um, the real estate industry works. And it will. We think, in, in our humble opinions, that this iBuyer thing that sort of started out as a just a concept, which, by the way, has been around forever, right? You know, the, it's funny. Zillow, have they come out with a single original idea? No, they didn't. So. They yeah. just took old real estate ideas from the 80s and the 90s, uh, and they just essentially made them sound revolutionary and tech-based, and that's all they're doing. They're just copying they're just all advertising the- advertising it more. Eventually. Exactly. <laughs> Well, so, you know, that's going to happen. And then you're also going to see um, that's going to happen with Open Door. Open Door is we are predicting, and if you listen to our podcast that we did in the past two weeks on Zillow and whatnot, you'll hear our other predictions with regards to that. But to summarize, uh, Open Door, in essence, is going to have what appears to be an unlimited amount of money to then also start uh, gobbling up market share. And we think that Open Door will do some sort of acquisition. Um, and get themselves also a 50-state brokerage. And you're going to see this sort of trend continue. There, do, there does not seem to be any other dominant players that are operating on this level with the exception of EXP Realty. So in our opinion, there could be other players that we're not taking into consideration. But in our opinion, you're going to see EXP Realty, um, Zillow, and Open Door all become the dominant, essentially, technology companies in real estate. Um, the open door is valued at five billion. Zillow is valued at twenty billion, close to it. 
EXP is valued at $3 billion. Now, if, Z, if the world starts seeing EXP in the same light that those other two companies are valued as, then you're going to see EXP be valued as much as possibly Zillow, if not more. When, these are all predictions, right? Don't hold us well, to these it. These aren't just our predictions. There is an article I think Brad Inman came out with saying right. that, you know, that's basically it. Right. You know, that EXP is on the rise in the same sense as the tech company. And if it starts being seen more like that, then, you know, the sky's the limit. Spencer Raskoff, the former mm-hmm. CEO of Zillow, actually said something similar. Everyone's basically acknowledging that EXP yeah. a real player. is a real player. And in our opinion, what you're going to see is you're going to see those three be the most dominant players. I said three to five because I'm not, you know, there might be a couple others that I'm not aware of that might be getting their acts together. But these are the ones that are already in the marketplace that are already, you know, publicly traded in essence, and already have the uh, impetus and the leadership to really carry something through. That's what's exciting. So you have to think from an agent's perspective, if you're going to make a strategic decision now in fourth quarter of 2020, anticipating that there is going to be a real difference in the manner in which sellers expect to interact with you going forward, you better align with one of those companies. So you better decide to work for one of those companies as a salaried employee, which I have no idea why you'd want to do that. Or you better move quickly to become an EXP agent. But here's the thing with EXP. You can get all the benefit that you otherwise would with the other companies without having to be a salaried employee. You can have your independence because, you know, Zillow Homes had said, you're going to be an employee. That's it. There's no moonlighting. There's no doing anything else. You're just going to work. You're an employee. Yeah. So why would you do that? Because you want a lot of listing leads. Well, EXP has that same advantage. If you move this around, it's going to sound like you're moving around. Yeah, that's okay. Julie's talking with her hand while holding the mic. It's actually kind of funny to watch. (laughs) Stop. (laughs) Yeah. It's you. It's not the mic. I know. (laughs) <laughs> I was switching hands, so it's less likely. I but know. my point is that with EXP, you can still have all of your same autonomy, including if you've worked really hard on your own brand, your own name, and you've got all that impetus behind you. If you went to the other two, you're going to have to give all that up. If you stick with EXP, you get the express offer widget, which competes with the instant offer. And so you get all that benefit. Well, so what Julie's describing is that you as an agent are essentially, you have an iBuyer tool that um, EXP has created for you. So you can go into listing appointments. You can essentially have the same market power as a Zillow or any of these other iBuyers because you have EXP's iBuyer in your in your back you know, pocket. What are you going to do otherwise? You're going to go on listing appointments and after the seller's already basically caught in the ecosystem of, you know, Zillow and open door from having asked for iBuyer offers, which is what the behavior will be. Yep. You're going to walk in there and tell them that the iBuyers are terrible. All the while, these iBuyers are spending billions and billions of dollars to build a, you know, incredible consumer brand. You think you're going to be able to compete? Well, see, that's missing the point too, because the average agent's brain is saying, well, what seller would take that, especially in a hot seller's offer, it's not market. hot seller's market. That's not the point. Right. The point is that you're getting the lead. You're getting your phone to ring. You're having the option. People are just curious. It's like, you know, when you go to trade your car in, don't you get a whole bunch of wholesale offers and see what dealer is going to give well, you the Auto best Max, offer? Well, AutoMax, right? AutoMax. You're not necessarily going to take it, but you're shopping it. So and which, now you become a lead. So AutoMax, as you guys know, I think I got that right this week. I always forget the name. But AutoMax is this, you know, Isn't it's it a CarMax? Pu- CarMax. CarMax. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So CarMax, as you guys may or may not know, is a publicly traded company. And they really did change radically in the manner in which uh, consumers will get rid of their old cars. And they then essentially caused the used car industry uh, to go through this metamorphosis really quick where before these, you know, the used car dealers would, you, you'd have to go one to the other to the other. And they, it was just sort of like walking out your front door, grabbing the keys to your car, driving in different places and getting punched in the head, essentially. And you never knew whether you're getting a fair offer or not. Well, you can take your car to CarMax and they'll give you one offer, take it or leave it. And, you know, they'll put it in writing. And depending on your market, they actually might better another written offer. That's really kind of the thing that you're going to start seeing happen with these I buyers. And the reason that the a lot of agents are underestimating it, and frankly, a lot of brokerages other than EXP are under, uh, underestimating it, is because what that will create in the marketplace are is a change in consumer expectations of what a broker does. And if again, I'm going to emphasize this because it's incredibly important. Julie brought up a really valid point with regards to the way that leads will be generated on the listing side. It, it just don't forget that. And if you're not essentially following the footsteps of these market trends, chances are you're going to be ran over. You know, here in, in the United States, you know, there's lots of flat squirrels, squirrels that didn't mm. move fast enough. Here in Puerto Rico, there's lots of flat iguanas. Mongooses. Iguan, <laughs> iguanas that didn't move fast enough. So when you're when you're in a, when you're in the position right now where you're trying to think about how to position yourself, you gotta imagine you're gonna be sitting in front of a seller. And the seller is gonna essentially have 
you know, you're maybe they're interviewing your normal competitors, but what they're no, they're really going to be doing is they're going to be uh, comparing you to these tech laden companies. And if you're not working with a company that has all the tools that the you know the perceived tools that Zillow and Open Door and whatnot will be offering, you're not going to win. What are you going to do? And here's what will really shock you, most of you. You're going to say, I'm centers of influence in past clients. My centers of influence in past clients will always list with me because, and you fill in the blank of all these amiable sort of emotional reasons. Well, no, that's not true. Your centers of influence in past clients will also be comparing you to Zillow and Open Door. So you're going to go on and you're going to go on a listing appointment. And you're going to say, I can get you this, and this is what you have to do. Prepare the house, clean the house, this, this, that, and the other thing. A lot of work. Um, and you then don't necessarily control the move out date. You don't control really anything. It's just the traditional sales process. That's going to be what you are going to have to offer to your consumers, your prospective sellers, if you don't have an eye buyer on your side versus, and, and look, you're going to, you know, the house is listed for 300. You're going to be able to write them a check for tip or they're going to get a check for what? 285, somewhere in there, depending on the market after normal jib jab. Now they call out an eye buyer and the eye buyer, their offer is definitely less. It's going to be, but it's not that much less. So the seller is then going to have an option of selling their house to an iBuyer, choosing their move out date, not having to do any home preparation, not having to do really any work whatsoever to the property at all. Don't even have to clean it up, <laughs> you know, nothing. The slightly less net is basically a convenience fee. And they're going to basically net, what, five or seven or sometimes $10,000 less. As Julie just said, it's a convenience fee for not having to hassle with it. And that's the biggest uh if you think about, if you had to put your house for sale right now, or if Julie and I, Julie and I never, ever have sold any of our personal properties uh, while we live there. We always basically move to our next one and sell it vacant because it's too much of a hassle. If And if someone were to come around, um, I mean, of course, I don't think we've ever had a hard time selling any of our properties, but if that would ever have happened and someone were to say, I'll give you $10,000 less or $15,000 less or whatever, and you can just basically be in control of the whole process, I would have definitely had a serious look at that. I think so too. I mean, I know that some of our neighbors in Texas, actually that happened when somebody prospected yeah, them out of convenience. I mean, I can, you know, I can think of several. Um, so even that, if they don't even, underestimate yeah, it, though, don't but, un underestimate it, you know, that's why, you know, to use the car analogy, if you take your car and yeah, you're going to take a little bit less, but it's done today over with. Right. That's pretty tempting. And, you know, people have speculated what the impact we've been listening to some other um, podcasts and things and studying this. What might the impact be of that? Well, the speed in which people move, the frequency in which people move, if they can do it conveniently. And I think, you know, how many people right now are not selling because of COVID? They don't want people in their houses, right? But there also is going to be effect even if the market starts to become even more distressed. If somebody mm -hmm. basically, even if they're, you know, let's say they're, if it, in certain markets there will be distressed real sure. estate, it's inevitable. There always is. No matter what's going on, hottest seller's market ever, there's still parts of the country where the market's crap. Well, look, the I buyers aren't just going to uniformly buy in all price ranges in all markets. But hypothetically, the I buyers could step in and buy those properties. And then here's the crazy part. They, and this, this is the type of thinking, this is how you guys have to think, because this is the type of thing that happens when a lot of companies are f uh, fighting with each other to try to get market share. They could actually write a check to cover the negative equity in the property. So if there's a property that they want to buy that they can flip, they might actually be able to buy that house, prevent that seller from going into uh, any kind of short sale or, or any kind of you know foreclosure process. And that's taking the inventory out of the market way upstream. We're just guessing here. Yeah, but they have the millions to do it with. Billions. The, the billions to do it with because the natural thought progression would be this. Okay, that's all well and good in a hot seller's market where the seller's got enough equity that they can take a tiny little convenience hit and be done with it and rationalize it. What happens if the market shifts? Well, these types of companies have enough money to make that seller whole, thus preventing something like a short seller or a foreclosure and taking inventory out of the market and also perhaps making it so that person is a viable buyer for something else, which also is their goal. Well, but think about this. I mean, they, that's just huge. Stay focused on what we're just talking about, because mm -hmm. this is the first time you and I talked about it from this angle. Yeah. This is the Sunday podcast. We work out thoughts. If you're dealing with, let's say the house has a market value of 300, mm -hmm. okay? And let's say the person owes 295. Okay. So with selling fees, they're underwater. A bit upside down, yeah. Right. So they're, but they're, and if... No, not a bit. If they're listing with their traditional agent, they're paying normal commissions sure. and closing costs and whatnot, that's going to be a minimum of another, what, $30,000. Right. Either writing a check at closing or making yourself a short sale. So that seller, right. So that seller is not a little bit underwater. That seller is sure. a lot underwater. Mm -hmm. And that's assuming no problems with the house or more negotiating. That seller, as you just said, is going to have to write a check for 
enough to cover the selling fees and all the Mickey Mouse of thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just thought of this. So that that basically most agents don't have the skill set to know what the hell to deal with that because that would be a short sale and most agents have no idea what a short sale is, let alone how to deal with it. If an I buyer comes in mm-hmm. and offers two ninety five for the property, mm-hmm. now let's assume the market value is you know more than that, mm-hmm. then that saves the person from having to do a short sale exactly. or. Yeah, or if they offer them, you know, two ninety five to pay off the loan plus another five grand and, and you know happy walking fee, they've taken that you know a graceful exit, whatever term you want to give it, basically giving the seller money. That gives the seller an opportunity to sell this house, not having to go through the whole. That's fascinating. Yes, and you know, so the model does work even in a declining. That's market. right, and remember that these companies also predictably will have a mortgage arm and all of these other things. Right. So they might even say finance the deficit. And do something like that. Let's say the only reason that you're upside down is because you have a HELOC. Normally, you'd short that HELOC. It would be bad for your credit, yada, yada. Let's say you're you're underwater by that same 30 grand. Well, guess what? Here comes Zillow Financing to make that hole for you at a super low interest rate, and now you get out. Let's scale that too. So if they can basically save people that are, let's call them marginally underwater, from essentially having to go through a short sale or a foreclosure mm-hmm. and thus saving their credit, they can just take that customer and they can put that customer right into another loan and buy a prop, another property. Exactly. Kind yeah. of like car dealers financing your negative equity into your next car and making you all happy at the end of the day. Exactly. You guys thinking big now? You seeing where we're we're going with this. So if you're in a traditional real estate brokerage who's basically going to do the traditional things, you explain to me how you compete in a market like that. Help me understand because you really can't. Yes, you're going to have centers of influence and past clients, but those centers of influence and past clients, they are going to be taking a hard look at all the different options. Now, here's another little, again, we're just, we're guessing here and we're working on our final, you know, maybe top five or top 10 predictions for 2021. But this is, the, I guess this is the sandbox where we're working on ideas. So here's another concept. What would prevent these companies from basically foregoing, like, you know, Zillow swears they're not going to get into uh, listing resale homes. Yeah, right. Okay. (laughs) So they generate 10 listing leads from their iBuyer ads and their oversaturation in marketplaces. Assume they're going to spend billions of dollars to compete to become the dominant name in iBuyer. Assume that's what they're going to do. Assume that Open Door is going to do the same thing. All these things happen. Now, what happens in those particular markets where they're all fighting for the same, obviously, sellers? What's to prevent a real estate brokerage called Zillow with employees who are who essentially can, you know, doesn't even have to make revenue. They can lose money because their value, their company has valued it so much on the stock exchange. What would prevent them from starting to list things at a dramatically reduced commission? A what, flat fee, say. A flat fee or a no fee. If you're going to basically use uh, Zillow's Zillow Home and you're going to sell your, you know, house resale, but you're also going to do, you're going to do your upleg, you're going to buy your next property through them. And then you're also going to basically do your mortgage for them. What would prevent them from basically listing your house resale for free? Yeah, you guys nothing. get the point? Again, Definitely disruptive, at least potentially disruptive. Right. And yeah. so the as consumers, as the expectation of what a real estate broker changes, if you don't and if you're not working with a real estate brokerage that's thinking and acting like these companies will, then you're going to be obsolete and you'll have done it to yourself. That's a simple, painful truth. And I'm, you know, don't allow that to happen. And yes, of course, Julie and I are aligned with eXp. We've been with eXp now for 21 months and it was one of the best business decisions we made. And one of the, our primary focus is the eXp is helping other agents discover eXp. And so if you're interested in joining Julie and I's eXp family, if you want to be part of our eXp group, Julie and I's personal group, uh, just text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. And Julie, you did say something really valid, which I loved. And it will increase the velocity of sales because this will shake loose all the people that would have normally had to wait mm-hmm. and pray and hope and all the rest of it. The convenience you, sellers who are saying, I would move, but where would I go to? And I don't want the hassle and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of people. For sure. So, so now here's the the next prediction. And we talked about this last Sunday, but I actually, these are one of my don't. I mean, we're let's okay. Well, let's touch on uh, commercial. Yeah. So commercial. There's another little uh, market segment: commercial real estate brokers that are ripe for disruption. Introducing EXP commercial. Make sure you're paying attention to that commercial agents. Here, I'll give you the punchline. Basically, you're going to have the same commission structure as the residential EXP agents do, where your cap is sixteen thousand dollars, where you can participate in revenue share. Where after you pay your cap, which for many of you it's going to be you know one transaction, then you're going to be looking at essentially being a hundred percent commission. So EXP is absolutely going to disrupt the whole commercial industry, and it you know just pay attention to that. Again, if you want to talk with that, talk to us about that. Just text us at five one two seven five eight zero two zero six. All right, so. 
Here's the next one. I don't think anyone's saying this, but I really think it's true. Mm -hmm. I've, I've listened to a bunch of podcasts. I've talked to a bunch of people. You and I have talked about this. I think, and this is the biggest uh, surprise for a lot of people, there's going look at you're looking at me. You don't know what I'm going to say. Mm. You actually do because we talked about this. Okay. I think there's going to be remember. an increase uh -huh. in the number of agents. Oh, yeah. We're already seeing it in the coaching side of our right. business, right? We're, an increase. Yeah. An increase for right. sure. And because here's why. What these tech companies have been trying to do since the 1990s is to disintermediate agents. It means to remove the middlemen. Uh, they've done it, you know, tech companies did it with all different market segments. But one thing has played out over the last, you know, 30 years, basically, is that humans do not want to have a, when making a big decision like buying or selling real estate, they want to have somebody, another human that's going to help them make that decision. So the technology companies, all these technology companies came roaring into the industry and behind closed doors, they were all talking about basically disintermediating agents or removing agents from the middle of the, of the uh, whole transaction. And I still get, you know, panicky emails and, you know, you guys asking me, do we think that's ever going to happen? And we always say the same thing. But here's what we're going to see. Zillow, actually, if there was a, co a company that was going to distance media agents, it would have been Zillow. And what did they do? They're in our business now. They're brokerages. <laughs> yeah, hiring people. Hiring, hiring who? Employees. Oh, yeah, real estate agents. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see the whole movement and the whole mindset from distance remediation for all these tech companies. They're all essentially going to wave the white flag of trying to get rid of agents. And now they're all going to have to you know, uniformly accept that agents are always going to be part of the equation. Even more so, agents are going to become a more integral part of the equation um, in a whole bunch of different ways. And so here's our prediction. There's going to be an increase in the number of agents, not a decrease. Um, during uh, housing booms, or uh, let's say this, during economic booms in the past, when people have been able to find jobs, their number of agents sort of plateaus or falls because people would just choose to have a salary. During housing or during economic crashes, more people get licenses because of the fact that they need to have sources of income to replace or supplement the income that they have. All right? There are very few people that are weirdos like Julie and I who got into this as a career. People fall into real estate for the most part, and 30% or something like that's part time. So, what's happened in the last boom? Uh, essentially, what we're coming out of the last boom that was caused by, let's say, for example, you know, the return of the housing market. Now we're going to see a continuation of a housing boom, we believe. But that market showed that the incre that there was an increase in the number of agents. And this housing crash, or let's say this economic crash, now economic recovery, no housing crash, sorry, I misspoke. We also are seeing an increase in the number of agents. Unemployment rose, number of agents increased. That was expected. Unemployment dropped, number of agents increased. That wasn't expected. So now what we're seeing for a whole variety of reasons is we're seeing a whole new generation of people. And Julie and I see it in our coaching business. Mm -hmm. We had since March, I don't know, if, did I tell you this? Since March, mm -hmm. between um, PCE and PC, we had something like, let me give you an actual number, eight or eight or 8,500 people join. One That's of our amazing. coaching programs, right? I can tell because I do a lot of those calls. Yeah, <laughs> and if you look to see, yeah. if you look to see the nature of the people that are joining, oh, yeah. they're not people that are your typical fifty-six-year-old agent who's been in the business for seventeen mm -hmm. years or whatever. They are new people, the millennials, and the people that we're seeing joining our coaching program, and frankly, our EXP group, mm -hmm. they're younger than us. Yes. Yeah, which uh, has never uh, happened. Definitely, I definitely hear that on the calls. And we have also people that got out of teaching, that got out of, um, you know, different service jobs. We have pilots. We have We have an honest-to-God rocket scientist that came from the Jet Propulsion Lab in L.A. Yeah. Well, we um, have – when you so. look at where our listeners are for this show, mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure this out, why we have so many listeners in um, – places where the military is forward deployed. Uh -huh. I mean, that's how smart I am. It does make sense. But there is a ton of military people that listen yes. to us based on where we're getting downloads. Yep. And they must be basically planning their careers when they come back and they want to get into real estate. Yep, that's true. That's true. And, and guys, listen, real estate is and probably always will be the smartest industry you can get into as long as you're willing to do the real work of real estate. It is phenomenal. Uh, the opportunity that real estate creates. But I'll have to say, and you know, on Sunday, I'm always feeling the sense of gratitude and my mind always is full of the things that I'm looking forward to, you know. What's the old saying? Everyone needs uh, some something to something that basically makes them feel... Uh, something to look forward to. Some, no, that's the third one. Oh, so something of purpose, right? Something of purpose with their life. They need someone to love and they need something to look forward to, right? That's kind of encapsulate how I feel mm -hmm. on Sunday. Yeah. So on Sunday, I'm, you know, and I, I think about to when you and I got into real estate, especially as I'm standing here looking at you, by the mm -hmm. way, and you're doing some yoga routines, which looks pretty hot. I have to say you're distracting <laughs> me. You're going to have to stop doing that. Okay, sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, you are seriously. Right. Okay. You, I can't Straighten up and fly, I can't, right? I can't concentrate. Yeah, <laughs> she's doing yoga in front of me to try, try, basically try to keep her blood pumping as we're finishing out the show. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if if I are getting into this business, you and I are back when you know we've been married for twenty nine years this mm-hmm. year. You know, did I have? To, you knew that. I didn't have to I remind you. That. Okay, yeah. just want to make sure. And if you look, think back, and and you think back of all the, you know, we made more right moves than wrong moves, Mm -hmm. right? Professionally and otherwise. But I have to say, if I are, I would be so incredibly, if if you and I were like, you know, in our early 20s and we discovered EXP as a broker and Mm -hmm. we decided to get into real estate, can you imagine how much? I do feel, I actually, I feel honest to God, uh, excitement but if i'm being honest and maybe it's my ego i feel a little envious of me too definitely younger end of the spectrum because there's such an incredible runway in front of them with the opportunity that exp in particular can provide them yeah it's incredible yep where they'll be and and it's almost like skipping a bunch of steps in a way you know like they don't have to do the traditional route of gathering rental properties for 20 years to get to the same finish line so yeah i'm super excited for them and even if you are you know, towards the average age of agents, 55, you know, 60. Older than that now, sister. It's like 56, yeah. Yeah, but it, it still can be super beneficial to you so that you still can also look back and say, thank you, past, fill in your name for making that move, for making that shift. We're talking about, you know, there's so many different ways you, as normal agent, you can make money by obviously off your real estate commissions, right? At eXp, you can get paid multiple ways. The two, I think, ways that have become famous that uh, Glenn Sanford created uh, that has been revolutionizing, you know, the real estate industry, but also, frankly, it's been helping so many agents. It's almost emotional for me to think about some of the interactions I've had with agents mm-hmm. over the last almost two years, how they were, uh, how their lives have forever changed, the trajectory of their lives have changed. Most agents never retire. Most agents never have financial security. There's an, a report that I heard about. I haven't found this report, but I think it's true, that most of the top producing agents in the country, the agents that everyone you know thinks of as being having the you know the world by its tail mm-hmm. as far as success, they only have basically 60 days worth of savings. I know. It's horrible. Yeah, it is horrible. And so agents might, even great agents might be good at selling real estate and creating revenue, but they're terrible at building their own wealth. And I think it's so awesome what Glenn Sanford did. He actually says this too, is he built a system that will benefit agents despite their tendencies never to you know, financially yeah. save. But right? that, that's absolutely honest. And people have studied this for ages that typically agents don't pay their taxes on time and they never save. Right. And exactly. So this, this is the cure to that. It is. So look, um, you guys, many of you know what we're talking about, but if you don't, Text the word EXP to 31996. Text the word EXP to 31996, and we'll text you back. It's, a, I think, a nine-minute video. It goes over the it's – a, it's a great video that explains all the reasons why EXP has revolutionized the real estate industry. We gave you lots of examples on how you can use EXP's iBuyer program, but you know, to be honest with you, that's not even really the biggest – uh, reason why you want to align with eXp. It's a great brokerage. It offers all the best things that the best brokerages offer. There's no doubt. But beyond that, it creates multiple streams of income that, frankly, will benefit all of you. You can earn stock in the company, equity awards. You can look, guys, you just go through life doing your real estate transactions. You know pretty much where you're going to end up. Whatever you've done in the past 10 years or 20 years, you're probably going to follow that exact pattern. Remember how we started today's podcast? People, generally speaking, just do what they did before unless something really you know, huge comes and, change and disrupts that and forces a, a course correction. And that happens sometimes. I mean, the pandemic probably for a lot of people was that. But if you think in terms of the likelihood of you ever, you know, in the future, when you think about retiring, if you just look at the normal pattern behavior that most people follow, especially in the real estate industry, chances are you're not going to retire financially well off. Chances are you're basically going to be dependent on the government or a family member or both, like something like 95% of all Americans are. You know, most Americans never, when they reach the retirement age of 67, they're not, they have to, you know, scale back. They're living a diminished version of what they did. They're, they're maybe half a breath from living in poverty and they're dependent on the government and a family member. That's shocking, isn't it? But it's true. So if you have an opportunity to align with a company like eXp, where you can create passive, true passive income for yourself by just essentially welcoming other agents to eXp, you absolutely have to look at this because it forever could change your life. And then you become immune to market cycles. You become immune to interest rates and politics. You become actually free from all the usual consternations and stressors that most people just basically endure and they have normalized in their lives. That's what true passive income can do for all of you. So you have to seriously consider it. Just text the word EXP to 31996. 
text the word EXP to 31996. If you'd like to move forward and join our EXP family, just text Julie and I, or rather text me directly at 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. Any other interesting... Um, well, I mean, the, the rule here is don't hide your head in the sand. Don't think things are going to stay the same. If anything has happened in 2020, it's proven nothing can stay the same. And I think that the good thing about all this is all of this innovation and all of the opportunity is there and that maybe it was pushed there by the housing market and the enthusiasm. I mean, that's the shining part of the economy and of what's going on. So that's okay, but it's not okay to not do anything about it. It is hard to say what you just said, but it is true. During a time when a lot of people were suffering and still are, mm-hmm. housing really did and our industry really has done exceptionally well. Yes. Which, you know, actually, we don't need to vamp on this, but that is another point that we should think about for Mm -hmm. a prediction. I think the nature of what a home is has changed. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll never forget. I was reading one of my uh, fashion magazines, I guess, and the editor said, I've spent more time in my home office this year than I have in the past 12 years of owning my house. And it's come to make me appreciate, you know, this list of things that are really, truly important to me. And just the recalibration and the reinvestment. I'm studying whether humanism is going to come back, the investment in yourself and, you know, the thought that if it's wet, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. And there's a whole other sort of philosophical thing, I think, that's bubbling up around there. Uh, and we'll see, you know, when the year turns, our, our running joke is we need to see the terms of service and the FAQs. For 2021. For 2021, right. before we decide to sign up or not. So when 2021 so. <laughs> emails you or texts you. The, the I agree. The, 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 the new updated, uh, you know, TOS, the terms of service for New Year. I, and I know all of us forever have just been checking the box and moving on with life. Yeah, you want to read that. You want to read it this year because <laughs> you want to know what you're walking into because who knows, right? Right. But, you know, at least we can all agree to to try to have some enthusiasm about it and to study what's happening in our very hot real estate market and participate in the highest level you can. I just thought of another prediction, too. What? See, we need to, this is, so guys, I told you this is our sandbox. Well, obviously, there's going to be not just a change in uh, just all the things we've said, but it, uh, I know of a coaching client who's also part of our EXP family, Chris McGee, who's working with a national a builder who is venture funded with an enormous amount of money. Mm-hmm. I told you about this. Mm-hmm. And they've created really, really beautiful, modular, modern homes sure. that are designed to be self-sufficient and effectively be what would be considered off the grid. Mm-hmm. So they're gonna, you're going to see a new, if people uh, can use satellites or 5G work remotely, the land that's been sort of forgotten about in various parts of the country just because it was too far of a drive or it was, you know, you this, that, the other thing. All the normal things that people would have thought, if all of a sudden it, the market shifts where people no longer have to be dependent and be, be beholden to being near the center of the cities because, well, if you live out in the rural area, what do you got? Propane, sewer, septic, yep, all these no problems. no internet, phone's so, janky. So all of a sudden, if those types of things no longer become an encum- uh, encumbrance, is that yeah. the word? To living out in the middle of nowhere. How many people who are natural introverts like Julie and I? <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. So, right. Would, yeah. would find that appealing. That's well, going to be a big thing. And you, I don't know if you remember this person. We, we have a friend here in Puerto Rico that's got a similar type of um, you know, turnkey house that they can put anywhere that's hurricane proof, that's built, you know, wherever oh, you want to put it. Yeah. You know, and you add 5G to that. Yeah. I mean, that could be the hidden inventory story. So what if you, next year. what if you're an employer? I mean, you and I can go on for this, like this sure. forever, but what if you were an employer and all of a sudden you were used to say paying somebody, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year to do a particular job, mm-hmm. but they had to show up at your office. They had to live in this, you know, expensive area of the country these there are all these you know strings attached that's normally how people you know think sure well i can work for you but you're gonna have to pay my moving expenses all these collateral expenses well if i'm an employer at a big company and if i change my ad saying you can live wherever the heck you want to live on planet earth as Mm -hmm. long as you do this particular job and because essentially you know uh it's not even telephony but because of all the internet connectiveness and all the and latency issues be resolved if all of a sudden you literally could be real time and you know using 5g anywhere on planet earth and you could live anywhere on planet earth um that means i probably wouldn't have to pay you as much no and you'd be okay with it because you lost had the freedom. hassle factor right? right i just had this flash in my mind if somebody became a rural relocation specialist who knew about all these products and all right. the opportunities you know you could you could be paid as a consultant to help somebody do that well, so doesn't that also mean that there's a lot of people that are incredibly talented that would have mo- that basically these companies could all benefit from having hired, uh, but they didn't want to move? 
Yeah, absolutely. You get the, the other the, the, the flip yes, side. Yes, from the employer's standpoint, right. the opportunity and the pool of intellectual capability is now super expanded. Right. So what does this do to the whole premise of having to move people, the whole green card, a whole thing of having to hire talent from overseas, mm -hmm. the whole, all of it, doesn't it change? Absolutely. I think it's also going to impact a lot of commercial space. Yep. So we'll see, you know, the other side of that. And I actually heard something else. Mm -hmm. See, guys, like I said, we're sandboxing on Sunday. So you were warned at the top. We did give you the uh, Surgeon General uh, health warning at the st <laughs> top that we aren't organized on Sunday. We're just, you know. So um, I think also, and this is, argue against me. Well, lay it on me. What okay. I don't think a college degree is going to be worth crap in the future because they become ubiquitous. I don't know. I think it depends on the job that you're going after. You know, like I'd, I'd want my doctor to Yeah, 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 that. obviously. But for like executive positions right. and things like that, maybe not so much. Who was it? Uh, one of the podcasts you listened to said ben that, Shapiro. that he stopped looking at that as a major criteria right. and looks at more of like what you've accomplished and right. who you are and how you communicate and all that kind of stuff. So I think it'll be affected for sure. Well, I mean, if college degrees aren't necessary anymore and people yeah. can essentially, because you can get so much education online. Well, and very uh, specific information online right. for your specific job and not have to take like, you know, Geometry one on one. If you're going to not do anything to do with that, you know, not now, be forced to take all the crap that is irrelevant. You and I would argue it's the death of the liberal arts education, but I think it could be argued that the liberal arts education in the traditional Greek sense is already dead. Mm -hmm. So, with that said, if people are essentially going to uh, want to have actual jobs, you know, it's funny mm -hmm. is that back well in Germany they do it this way. Mm -hmm. When you get to the point where you're college edge educated, you know, college aged, you're going to uh, follow take a, couple, a path, a path. Yeah. And one path is going to be towards a trade mm -hmm. and another path is going to be more be towards, let's call it your traditional liberal arts type path, or maybe you're going to become a doctor or something that's going yeah, to require, but it you starts know. from there being very right. specific. But in the United States, we yeah. don't have a clear path like that. And matter okay. of fact, everyone is being pushed towards this liberal arts education, mm -hmm. even if they're more inclined to do sure. something that's more technical. Yeah, and that's you know traditionally been looked down upon that you go to that's like right. a, a tech school is, right. is not as sophisticated. I think that'll change. That'll change. For sure. And but what's more is I again online education, the acceptance of online degrees. Yep. Harvard is even doing online, so you're going to see mm -hmm. all of these you know uh, these comp the, I, I say companies, they really in essence are right. But you're going to see all these things that have been the standard bearers of traditional education. They have already basically said, okay, we're going to do online. And then as soon as that happens, that's going to open the floodgates for more people uh, to say, you know what? I don't have to go to this particular place and go into this level of debt mm -hmm. just to get an, uh, you know, an undergraduate degree in something that's not really practical. So that I then can decide what I really want to right. do. So then yeah. I then have to spend another three or yeah. four years in college and well, just I, rinse, wa you know, yeah. wash, rinse, and repeat. I think education is going to definitely go through a renaissance and a lot of change. I was reading something this morning that uh, Johns Hopkins has this um, test your kid for this program and that program from second grade on. That's awesome. Yeah. And if they score a certain way that they they can do all of their virtual classes through, you just like switch to Johns Hopkins to educate your kid in maybe they're really sciencey kid or, or an engineer type, starting from freaking second grade. But that's the way it should be. Yeah. I mean, you know, and they're still young enough that if they want to make a change, they can. But I, I haven't seen that before. Yeah. I mean, um, like you think, look you at know. Zoe right now with, with, you know, we're having to hone in and we're, and mm -hmm. I watch, you know, what she's doing on the screen and they're, because she's in this, uh, they're virtual trying to. Virtual classroom. But it's a virtual classroom that's sort of still trying to copy what a, you know, an online classroom. They haven't yeah. quite figured Some it out Some of it's yet. better than others, but right. we're still A lot of time wasted. Up. Yeah. And, and so for this reason, she goes to eco camp in the afternoon and does marine right. biology but it, locally. But there is a lot of yeah. time wasted on the way it's been oh, yeah. done because they're just trying to copy. So they haven't quite figured out yet sure. how to actually well, do Well, nobody online. thought they had to until recently. Right. And yeah. it seems like a lot so, of companies, yeah. but, you know, TASIS in particular, mm -hmm. it's sort of like they're just sort of trying to build a bridge and hoping and praying the pandemic is gone. Well, they're, they're definitely investing in trying to do it right you get but, my point but though. yes i mean this, this they're is not all in, in. The, no and i think that for a lot of this year it's been kind of like well we'll see how it goes how much the lot right. of schools are like uh, you know we're coming back soon we're coming back soon it's going to be okay all That's normal in line so i i think you're going to see a lot of hybrid and i think really the upshot of all of that is you'll have more options yeah. You know, some people have to have their kids, you know, if they're both working regular jobs, they have to have their kids parked at school or they, you know, don't want to spend it on a tutor or can't afford a tutor. And so they have a different option or you can mix that approach. 
that's going to be very different and much more acceptable. Well, so, so like really yeah. back into the work type of thing. Same kind of thing, just for school. Right. All these big yeah. uh, investment companies, everyone's paying attention to what they're doing, right? The biggest companies in the United States, in essence. They're saying you can work remotely. You just have to show up at the office and you know be on uh, campus for meetings for like a day a month or a day a quarter. Some kind or something of accountability. Like that. Right. So, yeah. Some kind of just showing up just to make sure you haven't gone completely feral, you know, basically. <laughs> right. we, 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 we see you on Zoom. But, we wonder what else you're doing. Right, exactly. But that these are the types of thoughts that I think all of us need to be having because then then what it does is it forces you to be uncomfortable and question all your, you know, the, the paradigms that you have or the, the limiting beliefs really that you have about what your potential could be. So, you know, is this motivational to all of you? It's motivational for us to think about this because at the heart of everything we just talked about is an expanding, improving real estate market. It's more opportunity for real estate agents. It's going to definitely require more real estate agents with specific skill sets that and a lot of specific tools that if your real estate brokerage doesn't offer those tools, you're going to have problems. You know, this is something to be excited about. This is yep. this time in history, this time in the real estate industry specifically, has to be the most interesting, amazing time ever since humans came out of caves. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, look at Bob. He built a grass hut. <laughs> <laughs> no. Look at the view Bob has. Do you I think know, do you crazy. think uh, these guys were called Bob? What would be No? I don't know. I don't know. What would Poor a caveman's caveman. name Did be? Did cavemen even have names? Hmm. I don't know. Bob. We gotta has GTS to have been Bob. that. <laughs> Anyway. All right, I think this podcast has peaked. Yes. <laughs> we need to get on because we're failing resort again. We are. So be so. optimistic, be excited, realize that you are in the right place at the right time, all dependent on whether or not you're going right, to uh, t- make the right moves. Don't be like most people where you're just going to wait around for yeah. things to play out and think that somehow magically uh, you know, you're going to figure it all out after everyone else has figured it. At that point, you won't have been an early mover and you You'll will have to play catch up. catch up. And most of the market will have already moved on and then you're going to have made yourself obsolete. So don't be don't be the guy who's still trying to explain to people why they all need to be buying these fancy VHS players when everybody else is streaming right under their, their iPhones. You guys get the point? Don't be that guy. Don't be that real estate broker who th- you think that somehow you're going to beat the odds in your little town and your little, you know, in your broker your agents are somehow just going to hold it out. You have a big, happy community and family, or you're an agent who's, I'm going to stay at this brokerage just because I have all these relationships. Those, That's great, but you can still have all those relationships. And by the way, you can create financial security for yourself and generations ahead. Or all those relationships can also come with you. Right. It's okay too. Open your mind to the possibilities, guys. Don't be so stuck in the mud with your limiting beliefs about your potential. That's really the takeaway. That's, I think, what my defrag is from this Sunday yes, podcast. Yes, so we covered a lot of ground, gave them a lot of things to think about. I think mainly the key here is to be flexible, be versatile. Say, yes, that sounds interesting, instead of, no, I'm going to wait and see how it goes for everybody else. And yes, we will be refining these points uh, as the months pass. And Julie and I are going to break all these random sandboxed ideas down to maybe 10 salient predictions. And we will. Those are usually some of our top podcasts and blog posts that we do every year as our predictions. But we will be working on these. If you guys want to suggest any that we didn't think of or any angles we didn't think of any on any of these things, feel free to text me at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day and we'll talk with you on the show anytime. Remember, there's over 3,000 past podcasts that are listening to you everywhere, basically. You know, you can't, you can't miss one of our podcasts. And thank you for continuing to make this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate agents, at least in the United States. Maybe I think we're starting to feel bold enough to have global ambitions now that we're in 54 mm-hmm. different countries. Your homework from today's podcast is if you've not taken a deep dive into EXP, text the word EXP to 31996. Or if you're ready to move forward, just text me directly at 512-758-0206. And your homework from every podcast is obviously to make sure you've purchased and read Harris Rules. We wrote the book for changing markets. The book is ready for you now at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, every other possible place you can ever think of um, to purchase books. At airports, we've seen it for sale everywhere. And can, and thank you for continuing to make it a bestseller. Thank you for almost the 400 five-star reviews. Um, and guys, listen, if we can ever do anything for you, never, ever hesitate to reach out to us. Have a fantastic day. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.